Thank you, everyone. So let's start. So what's going on with the Java news the last month? Java 1 happened. That's perfect. Uh, 20 years of Java, 95. Um, and they announced Java 9 and the Jigsaw. So that will be September 22nd, 2016. So that should be close. And um, everybody know Jigsaw? Somebody wants? Okay, perfect. So it's a new, it's a new feature in Java that will make it more modular, where you can specify which sections of the JDK that you want to load. Please correct me. If I, yep. So this is more. It will make it, I guess, much more easy, like lightweight. You just load whatever you want to, and it's pretty. If you want to check it out, it's pretty cool. It also lets you, your own applications. Same way that I didn't know that. That's perfect. Cool. And um, yeah, and then I think also whenever Java 9 is released, JDK 9, uh, Spring 5 will automatically have support for it. So now they are working Spring 5 on it. So whenever Java 9 is announced, Spring 5 is, I think it will be announced maybe around that time, and it will automatically have support for Java 9. So that's also cool. <coughs> Uh, Java EE is the early draft, so uh, um, new stuff that they will be adding. The comments will be on November uh, 20. Uh, they're adding this uh, servlet 4. The main stuff I like about it is HTTP 2 support. Uh, the MVC framework and all the lists, CDI alignment, JSON binding. And uh, they're planning for mid-2017. Hopefully they make it. And new releases, Java SE, they released a few updates. And um, it has the time zone, database update, minor security fixes. So they have the 65 and 66. Um, if you didn't update, please do. I like updates. Um, JRebel for Android. So if you used JRebel before, it will allow you to inject changes to your application while it's running without reloading it. So they are adding support for Android, and it's released in September. Uh, so if you develop with Android before, I did for a while, you don't need to reload the application. It will just, your changes will directly be injected in it on your phone. So it's pretty cool. But you need to pay for it, if you like it. Their marketing team is ridiculous. I like got their free trial, and then I got like phone calls, and emails. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, happy birthday. birthday. It's always happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Phenomenal how much they want to get it. But it's an awesome tool. Definitely. Like, I can have like, a running counter constantly counting up while I'm making code changes. And it just keeps, like, it doesn't reset anything. It's pretty awesome. Have you tried the Android or? No, no, I only used it for like, uh, for server app. Oh, OK. It's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, sorry. I was just saying they should rename it JStalker because their <laughs> marketing team is really sticky. That's yeah. true. I've met them twice in conferences. It wasn't a coincidence. Yep. <laughs> um, Jota Time 9. Uh, Jota Time 9. Uh, so that was the standard before, I guess, the standard of Java 8, before Java 8. Um, so they released a few uh, updates on their, um, on their um, software. But if you use Java 8, please use the Java Time package. Uh, which is basically, I think the person who created Joe that time, he was a main, uh, he was a main responsible for creating the Java time, and he made all the good things happen in it. Uh, what else? Okay, so in, I knew about this today. It's interesting. So Capsule Shield, it's like Docker, uh, but it's, it will take the too many things that are heavy that are not needed by Java applications to run. It will, they will, it will strip it out, and it will, um, it will run, it will make it so that it will run Java applications with less footprint, I guess. Probably, Jonathan, you have yeah, better experience. I just, I just found out about it today as well. Um, I, I think they were timing their announcement to coincide with Java 1. Uh, 
problems that work for us because we got a slide book. Cool. But uh, yeah, it looks interesting. It seems to do some things that Docker doesn't do, like helping you out getting your logs outside of the container to wherever you want it to be in a more Java way. And uh, leaves out stuff you don't need, like system images, because you just care what version of the JDK you're deploying. That's cool. I like new things. It's cool. So if you have a time, to, if you have time to check it out, I would, it would be nice. Uh, Ratpack 1.0, and today I learned what's the different, what's the relation between Sinatra and Ratpack. On that different level. Okay, so uh, <laughs> uh, it was supposed. Okay, so Sinatra. Uh, okay, let me re refactor that. So Sinatra is a singer. I guess, and then he was in a um, in a group called Rat Pack, and uh, Sinatra and Rat Pack was supposed to be a, I think, a implementation of Sinatra in Java, or in Groovy. I'm missing things. Yeah, you'll you'll explain it better. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> in Groovy. So, um, okay, I'll stop here. It's bad, but uh, <laughs> uh, so. Um, they are releasing their new uh, the 1.0 release. Uh, they have new features, and it's in Java 8. Um, if you haven't used it, uh, I read about it. It's basically allowing for uh, it uses Netty and then non-blocking I/O, and it uses the reactive streams. It's a pretty interesting way to create your own APIs in a, a new way. If you want to check it out too. If somebody likes hardware here, and then picking hardware. Intel is having a, um, a hackathon on the 21st and 22nd. Yep, I got that right, in November, where they will, in, and they have in many countries, and then they have one in Toronto here. So they will give, I think they will give like a specific kit, hardware kit, and then they have like, okay, do something with it. So if you're interested in that, definitely that's a good thing. And they have a meetup November 3rd. Um, and yeah, just check it out, it, it seems interesting. Awesome Java. So I learned, I, does anybody know about this or heard about it before? Okay, cool, nice. So whenever I like people, okay, why do you wanna use Java? So I gave them this, uh, ah. Oh, thank you very much. So it's a GitHub uh, repo, and it will list all the useful Java libraries out there that you want to use. And it's really, it's very huge, as expected. And then you can find, yeah, it's pretty cool. Like, you can find many things that you, like, I've never heard about it. Oh, that exists. That's very cool. Um, like, for example, build, you'll have Apache Maven, Bazel, Gradle, Bytecode, cluster code, configuration. It's pretty, if, like you can spend hours just looking into each one of them. And if you forget about the name of it, uh, if you go to Reddit and the Java subreddit, the link is uh, permanent on the right side. Awesome Java. So if you go there, it's right. And it's pretty cool. Like there's too many libraries or frameworks that I've never heard of. And just to pick around or just later on if you want to use it. So this one, anyone have any news do you want to share? Nothing? Okay. So today the presentation will be by Jonathan, and he will be doing the runtime performance showdown, comparing different languages, performances. Uh, and I've, I've, Jonathan presented that uh, uh, elsewhere, and then I was there, and it's pretty cool. I like it, especially whenever JavaScript is way behind <laughs> that evil language. Uh, but yeah, it, it's very fun to watch. So thank you very much. Jonathan. So the runtime performance showdown. I originally presented this here at the Jug in January 2010. Uh, I called it, Why is Java so slow? Because there was a prevailing uh, idea at the time that Java was the slowest possible place you could deploy your code and run it. Um, I think that's 
a misconception that's been largely corrected in the past six years. But uh, I was interested in finding out how things have changed in, in the intervening time. And uh, we were randomly invited to send people from Toronto to talk at Prairie DevCon back in June. Um, and I sent a list of things I could present on to the guy who was organizing it, and he picked this as one of them. So I got to spend time updating the numbers and see how things have changed since 2010. So the benchmark is the same as the last time we did this here at TJUG. It's this uh, game which I learned is called Peg Solitaire. You often find it on the table at restaurants that have a really slow kitchen. <laughs> Or at a cottage, yeah. Uh, specifically, it was a cottage where, where our fascination with this started. Um, Dan was there, and our friend Andrew was there, and, and it was raining out. And it's a beautiful cottage, but we couldn't go outside because it was raining too much. So we started playing Peg Solitaire and failing at it. And after a little while, we thought, wait a minute, we've got a laptop here. We could probably write a solver for this and solve it in less time than it takes for us to figure out how to solve it by hand. So this was 2010, and for whatever reason, I think the only language at our disposal was Perl. And uh, we had a solver in Perl and uh, wrote it, let it run overnight, and still didn't have an answer by the morning. So we thought, oh, OK, well, we were back in Toronto. Um, decided to take it more seriously. And I thought, okay, I'm going to just translate this line by line to Java, and uh, then I'll refactor it. Because the, the original solver we made took, it, it had a weird way of, its, uh, its approach to AI was, given a board state, what are all the possible legal moves? Let's choose a random one and do it, and throw away all the previous state. And if we get stuck, we'll just start over with a full board again. So. It wasn't the best kind of search for the game. So we thought, OK, well, we'll just rewrite it in Java so we can properly structure it. Um, but the thing was, uh, we did this line by line rewrite in Java and then thought, OK, well, let's just run it in the background where we're thinking about how to improve it and make it faster. But it came up with an answer in like 10 seconds. So <laughs> OK, that's done. Um, so that was where, where the fascination with this particular problem came about. Um, so I did end up rewriting it to something a little more reasonable, like an exhaustive search of the whole game state. And it's a really simple program. It's got three classes plus a main method that uses them to solve the game. And this, these three classes do give us the ability to do an exhaustive search of the whole game state and not just find a solution, but all of the solutions. Uh, and that's what the benchmark that we're looking at tonight is. So the types are uh, coordinate, where we have a row number starting from 0 at the top and going down to 5, and a whole number, which is how many holes across from the left you want to go. And it has one operation, which is to calculate all the possible moves that you can do from that spot. Where can you jump to? So you have to jump over a peg and land in an empty hole. The coordinate doesn't know which holes are empty or not, because it doesn't use the game state. It just tells you all the possible moves you can do from that place without going off the board. So it knows about the shape of the board, but not the state of the board. Uh, then there's a type called move that you take three coordinates. You say, where did I start? What did I jump over? And where did I jump to? It's obviously not the most efficient thing ever, but by including all three spots in move, we can have sanity checks. When you ask the game state to apply a move, the game state can actually check that the move is valid and that it doesn't have three completely unrelated coordinates. And we use that. And I will tell you right now that helped a lot in porting this to different languages because I made mistakes and having sanity checks was good. Uh, and finally, at the bottom, we have the game state, which actually counts which holes are empty and which holes are full. And it uses the possible moves operation that coordinate can do to calculate all the possible moves, filter out the ones that you can't do because the two hole is occupied, and then let you explore all of the states from there. So that all makes sense. I think 
Any questions about how that all works? OK. So there's some ground rules for comparing different languages and different implementations of this search algorithm. For measuring how much time it takes, we'll do five tries in a row. So you give the OS a time to warm up and, and have all of the parts of the runtime environment in memory, like in the page cache or wherever it lives, rather than counting how long it takes to load things off disk. We use the default settings for each runtime. No tuning or optimization parameters. Just run the thing. So with Java, you'd type Java, have a class path, and tell it which main class to use. Uh, with Ruby or Python, you just tell it which thing to run. No other parameters. We measure wall clock time, not system time. It's usually the same because the machine is otherwise not busy, but that's what we're doing. Not using any third party libraries outside of what the language provides itself. So in Java, for example, we're not bringing in Guava or anything else. Um, and we use normal default data structures. We're not writing custom data structures to achieve all of this. So in Java, we're using lists and sets and maps and things like that. Um, we're not writing our own list type. We use dynamic allocation, meaning that we're not presupposing how much memory we need. We're not um, pre-allocating a big chunk of memory and doing something clever inside of there. Um, we're just, if we need a new instance of coordinate, we're going to have a new coordinate. No pooling or anything like that. We store all the objects on the heap rather than the stack. Again, just because we're trying to represent what, like, what kind of code we would want to have to maintain if you carry a pager, what kind of code you would want running in production. Um, we're just doing regular, normal, maintainable programming stuff here. We're not trying to be really super optimal. And uh, I guess that sums it up. It's just safe, maintainable code, not, not hyper-optimized code that's hard to read. It's code that anybody could look at and understand what it does. So you don't have an I don't, no. Okay. Hello. <laughs> yeah, no, we probably couldn't make one. Yeah. That would be bad. So the, this particular workload, given all of those constraints, does quite a lot of dynamic on-heap allocation and freeing. It does a lot of branching. It has if and else loops. Um, a lot of the branching is about the sanity checks that the code does. Like when you pass a move to a game state, the game state validates that the to hole is empty and the jumped hole is not and the from hole is not. Uh, so there's branching there and most of the branches end in throwing an exception or applying the, the move that you asked for. There's lots of, lots of sanity checks throughout the code and that's where a lot of the, uh, the if else is. The loops of course are just for exploring the whole tree of game state. Um, iterating over collections is a big thing in this workload. For the same reason, we're exploring the whole game state, so we have to go through the list of all the possible moves in each spot in the game. And there's a ton of method calls, both within the three classes that we looked at there and then also into the libraries. It uh, doesn't do any network I.O., any file I.O. other than loading the code that we're running which is implied, it's not, no explicit file I.O. at all. Um, no multiple threads, it's all, it's a single threaded solver. So here are the languages and runtimes that we're comparing today for this problem. And they fit roughly into three-ish categories. So on the left, we've got the dynamic kind of classically scripting languages of Python, Ruby, PHP, and JavaScript. These are languages where you typically deploy your app as source code, and it's interpreted and run at runtime. Then the middle section, we have C Sharp and Java, which are a very similar runtime model where you compile them up front into some sort of intermediate representation. We call it bytecode in Java. And then you give the bytecode to 
an interpreter that then does a just-in-time compile to machine code at runtime. Go is kind of in this group, but not exactly, because with Go, when you compile your Go program, you target a specific CPU architecture and you get native code, but the Go runtime comes with a lot of stuff that you typically get in bytecode environments, like a garbage collector, and type checks at runtime, array bounds checking, and lots of other kind of managed runtime type things. But it doesn't have that intermediate representation. It's got machine code that, that the compiler spit out. And then finally, over on the right is C. C++ would go there as well if we had a C++ implementation of this. Um, and these are sort of unmanaged environments. You can go past the end of an array and C, and the runtime doesn't care. Uh, and we'll get into a lot of those other differences later when we get to C. But it's definitely not in that middle class. So challenger number one is Python. And just a quick rundown of the capabilities of Python. If we have any Python people here, please correct me or tell me that I'm wrong if I'm saying something bad about Python. Um, there is some language support for classes and objects in Python, and we took advantage of that. Because again, the goal was to take what, what we had in Java and translate it line for line as much as possible into these other languages. Um, Python has dynamic object properties, which means you don't have to commit to what the properties of your objects are in the code itself. You can add new properties by assigning to them. Python types are compared or used uh, with the system called duck typing, which is that if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. Um, so for example, if you had another thing that was not my coordinate type, but it was your coordinate type, and it had properties called from, jumped, and to, you could pass one of those to my game state, and my game state would do fine with it, because all it cares is that it can call from, jumped, and to on the thing. It could have other operations, it wouldn't matter. Um, the thing is coordinate enough that the game state would use it as a coordinate. Um, Python doesn't support private instance members, so you can't hide your internal state. It's always exposed. There's a kind of a naming scheme. I think it's prefixing your instance members with underscore that you're saying, you shouldn't use this as part of the public API because I reserve the right to change it in the future. But it's not hidden. It's still there. Um, there's no support for immutable objects where you say, it is impossible to change the state of this object. They can always be changed. Um, and there's some support for properties, uh, which I think got revamped a bit in Python 3. This check was on Python 2, uh, the latest version of Python 2 that was available in June. Uh, I did rewrite this for Python 3, and it was much, much slower, like five times slower or something. So I didn't include that result, because I think I was doing something wrong. Um, so Python 2.7.9. And this is how I checked. I just ran this five times in a row using time. And I took the fastest of the five. So this particular one took 24.257 seconds of wall clock time to find all of the solutions. Oh, and the, you can see the output. All of them have exactly the same output. It played. 137,000 games, found 1,550 ways to win, like they have one peg left, and took. There's an interesting discrepancy here. The, from the time when we said, we're starting now, till the time set with that we printed all of this, inside of Python was 23.3-ish seconds. And you can see that the real time spent was slightly more, like 900 milliseconds more. So that's just, we're looking at the startup cost for the Python runtime environment there. Um, so I think it would have been really cool if I had measured that discrepancy for each of the languages, because it differs. But it didn't. And the number that we're looking at is this one for all of the results. So Ruby next. Uh, 
Ruby is an object-oriented language. It has first-class support for classes and objects. Um, again, the members of your objects are dynamic. You can assign to them at will. Uh, Ruby similarly uses duct typing, so a thing with the same set of properties, or at least that subset of properties that someone else cares about will pass for that type of object. Ruby does have first class support for private instance members, so you can hide your data and your internal state isn't part of your public API. And also first class support for properties, so you can say, essentially I want things like getter and setter methods for this set of my instance variables and Ruby will do those for you. You don't have to write them explicitly. And here's how Ruby stacked up to Python back in June. It took less than half the amount of time to run the same program line for line. Um, I think a large amount of the time that Python spent was in property accessors, the getters and setters that the Python runtime made for us. So this is just an example of if, say you want to write a program sort of in air quotes correctly and use property accessors for everything, you're paying a large cost for that in Python that at least in Ruby 2.2.2 isn't as large of a cost. So I, I think that's an interesting difference. Another interesting note is that in January 2010, Python and Ruby current at the time were neck and neck at 45 seconds each. So they've both become a lot faster in the interim. And Ruby did better on property accessors uh, optimization in the meantime. Third challenger, PHP. I think Dan wrote this one. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> PHP wasn't in our original presentation, but uh, the original presentation inspired a few people to contribute more of these, and I, th I think Dan contributed the PHP one. Uh, so PHP does have some language support for classes and objects. It has fixed object properties, so you can't invent new properties at runtime and just assign to them. Uh, it has some strong typing. I honestly don't know much about PHP, so do you, do you have anything to say about types in PHP? Uh, it doesn't really have strong typing. Okay. Doesn't have strong typing. <laughs> um, <Or> typing. <laughs> okay. Not a lot of types going on. Fair enough. Everything's a C plan actually. <laughs> um, does support private instance members, according to my research. Um, does support immutable objects, which is cool. That's the first language we've seen so far that has that feature. Uh, but it doesn't have support for properties, so you have to write your own get and set methods for, for instance state. And PHP fared slightly worse than Ruby this time. Back when we originally did this, or at least when, when Dan contributed that uh, PHP version of this, PHP was doing better than both Python and Ruby. And I think at the time we were chalking that up to the performance work that Facebook had been doing on PHP. Because a lot of their stuff was implemented in PHP and they figured it was more efficient to try and... This is the standard PHP VM, but they did contribute some performance enhancements back to the main code base. This wasn't at all the thing. I remember they were working on a thing where they were compiling PHP to machine code. Um, I don't know what happened to that, but this wasn't that. I think they did that. They did that? That's done? Yeah. Okay. So this wasn't that. This was running in the regular interpreter. So next, JavaScript. Probably the most used of the scripting languages, just because it has that ubiquitous runtime environment in all the web browsers everywhere. Um, so JavaScript has some language support for classes and objects. There's actually a couple of ways you can approach object-oriented programming in JavaScript. Um, one of the schemes for declaring an object is the, like the function class pattern, something like that. And with that, you can actually achieve real private instance state and encapsulation. Um, 
and then there's another way of, of making classes in JavaScript that doesn't give you any tools for hiding your instance state. The thing, though, is if you use that function pattern, you can have private variables, but then you can always rewrite the accessors at runtime. That's true. Because you could. Something, is, something always has to be public, and that thing is always just you can change it to whatever you want. That's a very good point. You could, yes. You could always replace the accessor functions with something else. Uh, presumably, the code inside the class would continue to refer to the private part of the state, which is a, like if you declare a class as a function in JavaScript, you can have local variables inside that container function. And those are your private instance members, because they, all the other functions that you write that are like the public members uh, or public uh, functions or uh, methods, methods, that's what I was looking for. They can refer to those local variables inside the container function because they're in the closure of the functions. Uh, those functions could be replaced by anyone, but the ones that aren't would continue to refer to those variables in their closure unless they're explicitly calling the functions. So yeah, it's weak support for private instance members. Um, Properties of, of every object in JavaScript are dynamic. You can always add new properties to any object. Um, there's no real concept of classes. They have, uh, they call it prototypal inheritance, which is when you knew a thing, it just copies all the state from the thing you were knewing it from. And then from there, you can do whatever you want. You can add and delete members, and there's no real class. There's just a bunch of objects that were copied from the same thing and hopefully you didn't change them too much. Um, and there's also no canonical execution environment, which means we had to measure the performance of this program written in JavaScript across all the browsers and Node. <laughs> so they're all over the place. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So, Node and Chrome did not do well on this particular workload, but that's not to say, this is not indicative of how all JavaScript workloads run in the various browsers. This is just this one with the approach that this particular code base takes to OOP isn't something that Node and Chrome, the, the V8 runtime, not very happy about it. Uh, you, should, uh, you, you should quit compile your Java version. Because mm. <laughs> that would be really interesting. That would be interesting. We should do that. Um, yeah, uh, another sort of an interesting note about five years ago, this program, which hasn't been modified since January 2010, Node wasn't a thing yet, but Chrome was the winner then. And it has gone from winner status to loser status on exactly the same code in five and a half years. So that's interesting. Firefox is owning all the shipping languages. Firefox uh, TraceMonkey at the time was the loser on this set of code at that time. So they've switched places. Yeah. So that was, I thought, probably the most surprising result to me of this whole thing. This was the biggest change I observed. In yeah, Chrome was pretty lightweight when it first came out. That was like its best part, and now it's yeah, now they've yeah. changed places. Yeah. Like, because yeah, because when Chrome came out, Firefox, Firefox had it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And Nashorn, of course, is the Java script runtime that comes with Java 8, and uses Invoke Dynamic under the covers to implement some of the JavaScripty things. And in this particular case, it fared better than V8, but that's not typical. Most JavaScript workloads are faster on V8 than Nashorn currently. But the future may hold better things. So the next grouping are the managed runtimes, whether or not they're bytecode or native code. So question, is it fair to compare the scripting languages we've just looked at with the compiled or intermediate compiled and managed runtimes that we're looking at next. Oh, I thought I had a slide about why the why I asked that question. It's just a big slide with a no on it. Is it fair? I don't know. What does everybody I think? Would say life isn't fair, so 
so <laughs> it's, it's the same same work being done. So yeah, it's the same work being done in the same way, using the same set of types. Um, I guess it's fair. I don't know. You can't with any of these languages. You can't really like hot patch production by bringing up VI on your production box and changing a line of code. You can, yeah, you could edit your class file in VI, actually. Donnie, Donnie will do that for you. You could add the compile time to the the run run time stats on these things too. Like if it takes you know, yes. Compile time is, yeah, that's a very good point. So that's another is it a fair comparison thing. We've, we have front loaded some of the work and not counted it in these three languages because we're not measuring compile time, we're just measuring run time. And compile time is included in all the other stats. Yes, yeah. All those other languages that we looked at do parse the code and compile it to some sort of an intermediate representation before actually running it. That's probably where that one second Yeah, there's a small amount of code that we put in, but there's also the system libraries that we rely on, and those had to be treated in the same way. So, yeah, maybe maybe there is some unfairness going on here. Um, so we're coming to Java. That's probably the language that a lot of people in this room are most familiar with. We're rooting for it. Um, Java, of course, is an object-oriented programming language, so we have full support for classes and objects. Um, Donnie, do you want to say that that's not true? <laughs> Donnie likes Scala quite a bit, so. It's okay, I'll let it go. Okay, thanks. Um, properties in Java objects are fixed. You can't add new ones at runtime. Uh, again, Donnie's going to object to the next point, but Java has a strong and static type system. Strong in, in Scala quotes. And uh, private instance members, of course, we can have those. You can have immutable objects by declaring all of your state final and not calling out to, to untrusted code from your constructor and declaring your class final. Uh, and there is no language support for properties. You have to write your own getter and setter methods, which we did in this code. So how did Java do compared to See, OK, I put node here because it's the only server side runtime for JavaScript that we measured. Yeah, we could have put Nashorn. I added that late because I was curious, and I was surprised that it was not slower, but Java did better. Uh, <laughs> so I think even if you took the compile time into account, we're still winning. If we compiled the source code into bytecode and then ran it, I think we'd still be number one at this point. So we can eliminate that particular argument. Um, And interestingly, the, the amount of time it took Java to load those classes, plus all of the system library classes that it needed, and find the answers and print them out, was still less than the amount of time from when we started the Python interpreter until when it counted when it was starting. So we're doing OK. That wasn't always the case. Java 8 has made large strides in startup time. It used to be. Uh, Sort of a bad joke to write a command line program in Java because of the slow startup of the VM, but it's getting better. If your program is small, there's not a lot of overhead there. So next we have Go. It's a systems programming language from Google that's being pressed into a lot of non-systems programming areas these days. Um, it's definitely an up-and-coming middleware language. Uh, it's got support for interfaces and objects. The way Go does interfaces is different from traditional OOP languages. Um, when you implement an interface on your type, you do it by just implementing all of the things that the interface declares that it has. 
you never actually say that you're intentionally implementing the interface. So the reason for this, uh, there's a name for this I found out, it's called structural typing. The reason for this is that you can pick out some feature of a type that you didn't write that you don't have control over, create an interface that represents it, and then make your own alternative implementation to that and use both the one that you don't control and the one that you do control as implementations of that interface. That's something you can't do in Java. You can't make up a new, a new interface for a type that you didn't write. So that's the advantage that that you get from structural typing. The disadvantages that I've found in my first-hand experience is maintaining uh, code in a Go code base is that it's actually really hard to figure out what interfaces a type implements, because it doesn't say. Tools could be better. Tools could tell you that, but they don't right now. There's no Go IDE that I've found that can tell you that information. Um, so object state is stored in structs like you do in C. It's, it's very much a better C in this respect. Like how you would do OOP in C is you take, OK, here's all the state that I want. I'll declare a struct for it. And then I'll have a .h file that declares all the functions that operate on that struct and takes that struct as its first argument. And then I'll make a .c file that implements all of those function prototypes in the .h. And does operations that either use the state in the struct that you passed in and return some value, or you could mutate the state in that struct. Go works very much like that. Uh, they give you a little bit of nicer syntax for that, where instead of having the struct as the first argument to the function, you put the struct to the left of the function name. Left is that way for you guys. Um, and that's the, like, the receiver struct. And that's how you implement a new operation on a struct. And then inside of the, you, you name it too. It's not, it's not called this. You just, you name it in your function signature. And then inside the function, that's available to you as one of the variables in your function. Um, so that's, that's how Go approaches object-oriented programming. It's kind of like the, the pattern that you use in C, but it's been formalized and, and given you a nicer syntax. And then when you want to call functions, you don't need to use the arrow operator if it's a pointer and the dot operator if it's a value. You just always use dot, and the compiler knows what you mean. So that's kind of nice as well. And you get to choose whether you want pointers or values everywhere. And that turns into you have to choose, because you, you have to make that decision. When you're, when you're choosing your receiver, it's either a pointer or a value, and you have to pick. Um, in this particular code, most of the receivers are value receivers, which turned out, I tried changing them all to pointers, and it got slower. So these are the value receivers. This is kind of like a better case that we're measuring here. In the effective Go manual, the Go people recommend that if in doubt, you use a pointer receiver. Because of course, you can't, with a value receiver, you can't mutate the state of the struct that you're receiving. Because if it's passed by value, you're just mutating the value on the stack that's going to get popped off. Whereas if you receive a pointer, it's a heap allocated thing, and anything you assign to the struct lives on beyond your function return. Um, so anyway, we're, we're mostly doing pass by value in, in this particular benchmark. Pass by reference was slower. Um, you can have private struct members. The way you do that is by starting their name with a lowercase letter. Anything with an uppercase letter is public. Uh, you can make immutable objects uh, by making all of your state private and not providing mutator methods for them. There's no language help for properties. It's a very do-it-yourself ethos in Go, so if you want getters and setters, you can, but you have to write them yourself. And uh, I already went over that last point. So go with lots of pass by value, weighed in at slightly slower than Java 1.8 update 25, which was a surprise to me because it was starting with machine code already. It didn't have to do any compilation to x86 at runtime. It was starting with x86 code. 
Um, and that's, that's how it fared. It was over one second with pass by reference everything. So next, C sharp. Now, the conference that I was presenting this at that I redid all these measurements for was predominantly a Microsoft crowd, and I really wanted to use the new um, .NET runtime for Mac that had been open source just shortly before the conference started. But the runtime at the time, I can't remember what it's called. Does anybody know? The, Roslyn, the, the official? What's sorry? What's, Roslyn. Yeah, Roslyn, thank you. It wasn't working that day when I was trying to make this work. It couldn't find any of the standard library types. And I found out that was a known issue that they were working on. So I had to measure it on mono, which on OS X is a much more mature runtime, or especially it was in June. Um, but it's known to not be as fast as the real Microsoft one. Uh, so C Sharp started kind of as a Java clone and then grew from there and got a lot more language features than Java has. Uh, it, does, it is a full object-oriented language. You have strong and static typing, private instance members, immutable objects, uh, and properties, something that we still don't have in Java. So we used C Sharp properties for this. And Mono did that. It actually did quite well, I think, given that it's not the fastest way of running that code. Uh, just over 1.1 seconds to solve the problem. So that middle cluster of, of the, the managed runtimes with compiled or intermediate representation code definitely, and, and also more restricted type systems, right? Because you can't add new properties to objects at runtime. Uh, there was certainly a performance advantage there. So C, we'll ask the same question again about C. Is it fair to compare C to all of the things before? Because so far, every language we've looked at, if we overran the end of an array, we would get a friendly exception that told us which array we overran the bounds of. Uh, C wouldn't do that for us. You can link C against allocators that put every allocation up against uh, an inaccessible memory page. That makes the program run a lot slower because it's not using memory very efficiently at all. Um, and all you get then is a seg fault and you have to use a debugger to find out why it's seg faulted. Um, the, it's compiled straight to machine code. Um, what other things are unfair about comparing C to managed runtimes? The compiler is a lot slower, mostly because it has a preprocessor. Um, oh, here's my, that list I was expecting to see last time. Got talking points. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, the C standard library doesn't have collections. It's the first language we've looked at where you have to like, bring your own auto-expandable list type. Because you get arrays in C, but you don't get a list that you can keep adding stuff to and it grows on demand. Um, it also doesn't have a garbage collector. First language we've looked at here that doesn't do garbage collection. So you have to know when it's OK to free stuff. And the way this app was structured, we run through all of the possible game states and save references to the sequence of moves that is a winning sequence, if we find out the board has only one thing on it. That's trivial when all of the stuff was heap allocated, because you just keep the pointer to the winning sequence of moves, and all, the, all of the uh, coordinates that it refers to are just retained on the heap. If you freed that stuff when you left that branch of the code in C, you'd be holding on to pointers to memory that you freed, and you wouldn't get the right answer at the end. So that was another thing. I had to build a reference counting system to make this work. Uh, C doesn't give you exceptions of any kind. Forget array index out of bounds. There's just, you can't throw an exception. You have to have some sort of distinguished return value, like returning a negative number when a positive one was expected. And then every caller has to check to see if that happened. Or you could use go to. 
Um, go to is a, yeah, that's a common pattern in, in C functions where you can use go to kind of like finally um, to clean things up. But you still, to throw an exception three steps up the stack, that's something that each call site has to be responsible for. Plus you have to clean up memory. Yes, which is where go to comes in handy. If you've allocated some temporary memory in your function, go to is really handy to have a place where you free all the things that aren't null. Yeah, uh, there's no type safety at runtime. Also, the first language we've looked at, which really can't help you determine if the struct that you're dereferencing a pointer to is the struct that you think it is. You will happily index the right amount of, of uh, offset into that base pointer, grab the number of bytes that the compiler determined it would take for that property, and get that value and do something with it. There's no safety in the runtime system that will tell you you're looking at the wrong kind of memory. Uh, no array bounce checking. Mentioned that a few times already. So, I think I just said all these things. Yeah. Oh, and no immutable anything. That's another good one. So. Oh my goodness. Oh, that last one is good. I didn't say that yet. There's also no runtime system in C. You just run your code. So, how long did it take to calculate this in C? Can't be right. What happened? What happened? C did worse than the Firefox JavaScript interpreter. <laughs> um, on a line by line translation of the same program. Yes, I, try, I spent a whole day trying to make it faster by compiling it differently. I used, um, I used LLVM profile guided optimization because the program only does one thing. Like when you run it, it's completely deterministic. And I thought if anything would be helped by profile guided optimization, it would be this. Because it's a program that has exactly the same behavior every time you run it. And uh, it came out exactly the same to the millisecond when it was compiled with, with full profiling information about what it would do at runtime, which surprised me. Um, I checked really carefully to make sure I wasn't using it wrong, but um, this was the best I could do given the compilers available in OS X in June. So of course I had to profile it to figure out what's going on, because this is a surprising result, right? So, we've got some preconceptions or, or rumors. I called them rumors back in 2010. I probably should call them pre preconceptions now. Um, that the things that make the middle cluster slower than C are your automatic garbage collection, the work of interpreting bytecode and compiling it at runtime for Java and C Sharp, and their big large runtime footprint compared to C, which is just your program or the scripting languages, which are somehow lightweight because the word script is in scripting language. So let's look at how did Hotspot handle collecting garbage when we ran this program with just default arguments. It did three, six, seven. It did seven garbage collections because it ran out of memory in the Eden space when it was running the program and each of them took less than one one hundredth of a second. It was about a, just over one one thousandth of a second. And it collected quite a lot of garbage in each pass, as you can see, because this program generates a ton of garbage on the heap. It's exploring all these game states and most of what it finds is not a winning move, which means it's not memory we need to retain. That adds up to about one one hundredth of a second for the entire exploration of that whole possible set of moves.
and it collected almost 400 megabytes of dead objects in that amount of time. So that's not like a huge cost that you're paying there for the garbage collection. On the other hand, if we profile the C program, there's no filtering here. This is just all the things it was doing. Measuring the amount of time spent in each distinguishable function by self time, which is how much time the function itself spent. You can see that uh, the top one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. The top 11 functions by self time were all related to allocating or freeing memory. And why is that? It's because it's actually an unmanaged runtime, and it can't make many assumptions about what your code is doing. And malloc and free have to be thread safe in C, because they don't know if you're using threads or not. You might be. You can use threads in C by having a little excerpt in the middle of your function that changes the program counter or the stack pointer. Like, you could, there's no way of knowing. Malloc couldn't know that you have a single threaded program. Anything, like any library call you make could create a thread behind your back. So all these things have to be thread safe, and there's a huge cost to that. And unlike Hotspot, where even when you go through a synchronized block, Hotspot can turn that into almost a no-op if the lock isn't contended. Malloc and Free can't, because they don't make any assumptions about what your code is doing. So there is a massive cost to not knowing what the program is doing. And you can see it here in the top 11 functions that weren't anything to do with the code that we wrote. The top thing that was code that we wrote was this one, a list contains, which was my implementation of array list in C, which was looking through an array to see if it contains a value. And it spent most of its time there comparing one struct that was passed in to all of the structs that were in the list. So that explains a large amount of why C got slower. It's because we were doing a lot of mallocking and freeing. But yeah, and there's, you can choose your own allocators as well. Like, this C runtime, C library you're using. Mm -hmm. the yeah, this is the default, the default libc that you link to when you compile using LLVM on OS X. Presumably, most of the OS X programs we run are linked to this one because it's the one that you get. But you can totally pass in your own allocators and uh, link to those instead. For example, the thing I was talking about where you can have an allocator that gives you every allocation up against the edge of a page that's not accessible so you can get bounds violations reported to you. Uh, there's a really old one that I used to use called Electric Fence. I'm sure there's newer ones that I don't know about now. But um, yeah, anything that exports symbols called malloc and free can stand in for this. But this one's like the one that Apple thinks you should use. So there, it spent more than double the amount of time that Java spent solving the problem just managing the heap. So we will dismiss automatic garbage collection as a reason that managed runtimes are slow and move on to all that work that the JIT compiler does at runtime. So here's a dump of what Hotspot was doing around compiling stuff while the program was running. This all happened, this is a small excerpt of the total log of all the things that Hotspot did about com compilation decisions. It goes on for more than 10 times that long in the 600 milliseconds that the program was running. But you can see the stuff that Hotspot thought should be compiled. It started with um, the game state dot apply which is the thing that checks that the move you're passing in has a valid from and jumped and to coordinate. They have to be in a straight line and they have to have the right state where, whether the hole is empty or full. Um, so that's that method. That turned into 10 bytes of machine code by the time Hotspot decided to compile it. 
uh, with all those conditions. It may have actually left some of them out because it may have had a way of proving that some of them could never be true. It can do that because it runs your code in interpretive mode and collects statistics before compiling it, uh, which helps a lot. Uh, what else here? We've got array list to array. I never called that directly. That must be done inside the library. But that got inlined somewhere, somewhere inside the game state apply. There's a getter. Hotspot actually figured out. There's a handwritten accessor, move.getfrom, turned into five bytes of code, and Hotspot knew that it was a getter. Even though I had to write it myself, the runtime knew that it was an accessor and did something optimal with it. Uh, you can see that happened again with get jumped. So pretty cool stuff the compiler does, and it does a lot of inlining for you. So there's not a lot of, like, method calls don't actually turn into things that move the instruction pointer other than where it would have gone, because that's really expensive in a pipelined execution environment. So the JIT turned out to be a good thing, not a bad thing, for running this program, even though the thing didn't have much warm-up time before it was done. And then finally, there's, like, the large footprint. Java's huge, right? We have, we have Jigsaw to try and solve that problem. Well, it is huge, actually, compared to Python and Ruby. Probably not compared to a web browser, but we don't know how much of a web browser is the JavaScript runtime, presumably less than 160 megabytes of it. Um, turns out a lot of that never gets loaded, though, because the JRE and the JDK include like JavaFX and Swing and other things like that. that this program didn't ever load any of those classes. Um, but it is definitely a large thing, and Jigsaw is a welcome improvement coming in Java 9. Should make this even faster with less overhead. So yes, it's bigger, but that didn't make it slower. And so our conclusion with a massive grain of salt behind it is that uh, for this particular real world problem that involved quite a lot of iteration, quite a lot of memory allocation and, and garbage collection, branching, Boolean logic, um, Java provided the easiest and fastest way to give us a reliable and maintainable solution to the problem. And that's all I have to say about that. I'd be interested in questions, if anybody has any. Yeah, come over and speed up my game. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's what the huge grain of salt was for. This, this, I, I promise you I did not do any, any performance optimization on the Java code or any other set of code. It's really just a line for line written as I would want to maintain it being nice to my future self type code base. I, I would be interested to see um, what it, what, like how different it would be if you got people who were, you know, regular users of each of these languages mm -hmm. to write, you know, like idiomatic sort of versions of it. Yep. How you would write this as a Python, you know, right. Python developer. Uh, that happened. Back in 2010, a coworker of mine posted this on GitHub. It had originally been on Google Code, but that's gone now. Um, so I moved it to GitHub. But there's an old, old, like six-year-old fork of this on GitHub. Uh, someone who was a big fan of Python took offense and <laughs> went about making it faster. And uh, that person over the period of about 24 hours, got the Python thing, which was taking 45 seconds at the time on my machine, down to about three seconds. It's pretty good. Um, but the code was totally unreadable when, when he was done. Like, it wasn't within the parameters of, I'm saying this is, I'm writing the code the way I would want to maintain it, not the way that I think it can run fastest or that I've, well, yeah, but, uh, but I mean, like, I'd be interested to, like, what, you know, what, um, like, a regular, 
in, in an idiomatic way for Python that is the way that someone would write it that's maintainable, right? Right, right. Because I, I don't know. I don't know what that is either. I don't know how fond people in the Python world are of object-oriented programming versus just using functions or whatever. Right. No, I agree. Uh, and I think probably some of that is informed by what's fast or not. I know that's true of Java. Yeah. Um, we've been fortunate in that the runtime has often been tailored to make things that we did that weren't fast get faster over time. Um, but definitely there are, there are things that we do in every language that we do because they have a performance advantage and they're just sort of baked into the way we think about solving problems because we get used to them. Yeah, so I agree. I agree. That would be a really interesting thing to look at. I hope it would help JavaScript more than any of the others because that one was by far the most variable. Yeah. Um, although I shouldn't say that because the Python 2 to Python 3 rewrite that I did, that we, we didn't see the numbers here, but I, was, I didn't put the Python 3 one in because I figured I was doing something really dumb because it was much slower and I, I wasn't expecting that. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. It's been fun. And now it's time to have more beer and talk to each other.